Hi, Taras Pluskin here at the Top Shelf Aquatics Farm, and welcome to my small sea of green. Now, I, I'm a man that likes his algae. I like my microalgae. And of all the flavors, colors, species, and strains, there's a special place in my heart for Tetrasomus chewi, specifically strain PLY429, the strain of Tetrasomus chewi that we grow here at the TSA farm. An algae that I believe is not only uh, a bedrock, salty earth algae, an algae of the people, but it's an algae that offers so much limitless potential and benefit, both for the short term and long term of humanity, both at the small scale of the average reef aquarium and the large scale of commercial grand aquaculture as a whole. So in today's episode of TSA, we are going to be talking about Tetrasomus chewi and five reasons why it specifically benefits not only the reef aquarium generally, but all of humanity and commercial aquaculture at large. So without further ado, let's talk about this powerful chlorophyte, its amazing biology, and all the reasons why this particular species of algae is more valuable than the emeralds that share the same glorious green color as it. Stay tuned, let's talk about Tetracelmus. The first main benefit to Tetracelmus, and when discussing the benefit of any microalgae strain or species, we have to go to the nutritional profile of that species of algae. The nutritional profile, essentially every algae I grow here is just a tiny one cell factory. And we're really more kind of obsessed with what that factory is the capacity to make and how we get it to make that. So when it comes to Tetracelmus, we have, especially for a green algae, a fairly great nutritional profile. This is not iceberg lettuce. This is heirloom broccoli. This is a complicated cell that is able to contribute a lot of good nutrition to whatever organism is able to take it in. Specifically, all kinds of vitamins, minerals, good carbohydrates, but specifically, let's talk about the fats. Now, in an episode where we talked about T. isochryses, we stressed the importance of these polyunsaturated fatty acids. These are the golden fats, which are essentially the absolute necessity. They are the form of energy exchange that happens in the marine environment. If you're not operating in these unsaturated fats, you don't have the right energy reserves for short or long-term operations as a marine organism. Tetracelmus is unique because it is a green algae, and with it, many it carries on many of the benefits of being a green algae, but it does actually make some of those polyunsaturated fatty acids. Not nearly the same diverse and complete profile as something like Tetracycrises or even a diatom like Catoceros, but Tetracelmus has some really good fats associated with it. But that's not the specific magic when it comes to the nutrition of this particular species. No, 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 no. That is more in the long game. You see, besides having these great polyunsaturated fatty acids, these good lipids, these good fats, Tetracelmus also has really good and unique cholesterols. Now, cholesterols are something which we kind of associate with all this good and bad, especially when talking about human health, but cholesterols are absolutely essential in the marine environment, especially for things like crustaceans and the like. They can't synthesize it very well. They need it directly in their diet. So specifically, there are certain cholesterols, such as methylene cholesterols, which are the building blocks, of very complicated molecules that all these organisms need later in life. Things like hormones. They build these complicated molecules that are really important for some of that more nuanced growth and development in these marine animals' lives. One thing that when I first learned how to grow Tetracelmus is I was in an oyster hatchery and we were trying to grow lots of eastern oyster, metamorphose all those planktonic oyster babies, and then grow them out as little one millimeter spat or settled oysters. Now, something that was discovered and really teased out by some very smart people at the NOAA lab in Milford, Connecticut, is that when those oysters are going through metamorphosis, when they're transforming from a plankton to a settled small version of what we would consider an oyster, there is a huge metabolic tax associated with that change. 
just of all, just like all the energy and materials that must be required to turn a caterpillar into a butterfly. Now, what the folks at the Milford Lab discovered, which was so fascinating, is that you can feed oysters all the golden fats you want, even to the point where they'll do just fine. But if you really want to increase your survival and reduce mortality bottlenecks associated around that metamorphosis, you supply lots of Tetracelmus chewi and all of its good cholesterols will, and have been demonstrated to, dramatically improve the survival hood of oysters going through metamorphosis. Now, this is only one study that's been done, but who knows how many nutritional bottlenecks can be observed and resolved using this species and others like it, producing these cholesterols in the future. So these are a few things that are absolutely special when it comes to the specific nutritional profile of Tetracelmus chewi. The second main benefit when it comes to this algae is that it is a green algae. And basically, when you compare it to some of the reds and certainly some of the golds and browns, that means that it's tough. Tetracelmus chewi, and especially the Tetracelmus genus at large, can, is basically a powerhouse of survival. It can survive a wide range of salinities, temperatures, pHs. It will essentially modify the localized nano environment around it to allow that cell to live. And for that reason, you can have a successful Tetracelmus culture at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, you can have a successful Tetracelmus culture at 90 degrees Fahrenheit if you acclimate it correctly. This is a cell which can and will adapt. It's been jokingly said, especially at that Noah Milford lab, you can even grow Tetracelmus in a bathtub if you really want to. This is a very resilient cell and when, thus, when people are asking me for recommendation, Tross, I really wanna start playing with algae, I wanna start growing at home, I wanna get a starter culture, I wanna redose my tank, and I wanna see how that is over time, and someone really wants to cut their teeth and really kinda of get the feel for sterile technique and growing microalgae, I cannot recommend a green algae more. They're far more forgiving, and unless you abjectly kill them, far more likely will survive in a weakened state versus dying altogether. And if you cater to them, and certainly if you allow them to grow a few hundred thousand generations in your setup, they come back extremely robust and strong. Now, what's also really, really helpful about all the survivability that Tetracelmus demonstrates is that it stores really nicely. This is an algae that is very accommodating to being bottled, shipped, having the temperature drop, rise and still being viable. So for that reason, I really consider it an algae of the people where you don't need to have all a specialized setup, equipment, and the gut instincts of a nuanced phycologist to be able to practically work with this species, grow it, and use it to culture all kinds of things from copepods to shellfish all the way up to dosing it into a reef aquarium. Let's talk about the third major benefit when it comes to Tetracelmus. Let's take a quick look at the cultures behind me. My, some of them look like clean, pure green, but what's this? There's a little bit of modeling, some texture on the sides of my carboys. What is that? Oh, when we hit it, it almost comes loose like falling snow. Why, this green falling snow demonstrates another one of Tetracelmus's superpowers. That is the ability to create pseudo stocks. Now, many algae cells have a maximum amount of light that they can withstand. Normally, when an algae cell receives too much light, they either make pigments to block out some of that light, or they die. Tetracelmus has another option. It can actually change its cellular morphology. It changes its shape. Normally, it's swimming around with a little flagella, moving around like a little car, but when it's exposed to too much light, hence when it's right next to the lights at the edges of the carboy, it will actually stalk to surfaces which is a really fascinating ability. This allows Tetracelmus' cells to be able to stack on top of each other and shade each other from excess light. And it's when they're stalking and attaching to surfaces temporarily that they are not only available to a wide variety of filter feeding organisms and copepods and things swimming around the water column, but they're actually directly available now to snails, small urchins, things that are surface amphipods, things that are surface grazers that can and will access larger bodies and pseudo biofilms of Tetracelmus when they form in the rock work. So the stalking ability not only aids in Tetracelmus's survivability, especially when placed in a reef aquarium, but increases the amount and diversity of cleanup crew and other reef inhabitants that can actually feast on it directly. 
We talked about Tetrasalmus' amazing ability to survive in a wide range of environments. Frankly, the Reef Aquarium is one of those environments where Tetracelmus has all likelihood to be able to persist at least through a few generations. Eventually, it'll probably be grazed out or maybe outcompeted, but unlike a far more fragile T. isochrysis cell, Tetracelmus has an infinitely higher rate of being able to survive when placed into the Reef Aquarium. Not to the point where it's going to grow and color anything in the tank green, but certainly enough where you might probably have a more prolonged feeding interaction time when dosing this species of algae. Again, that's all well and good. Why do we care besides having a couple more hours of grazing opportunity and maybe the opportunity of feeding our snails as well? Well, we care because every single second, minute, hour, one of those Tetracelmus cells survives in the reef aquarium and it's not dying. What is it doing? It's either conducting photosynthesis or if it's in the dark, it's eating things, it's conducting heterotrophy. Either way, the Tetracelmus cell is acting as a nanoscale cleanup crew agent, where through photosynthesis, it's sucking up excess dissolved nutrients, nitrates, phosphates, ammonia, and the like from the water column. And when it's doing heterotrophy, it's consuming excess organics and other broken down organics that otherwise would be clogging other forms of filtration and it's bioassimilating them into more Tetracelmus cells. It's converting what essentially would be a tax and toxic buildup waste in the reef aquarium environment. It is recycling and reclaiming at least a percentage of that wasted asset and replenishing it back into Tetracelmus cells. Algae cells, which can then be either directly grazed upon by a coral, a clam, an oyster, zooplankton, copepods, um, or be skimmed up by the skimmer. Either way, Tetracelmus, by persisting, just by surviving, even for a few hours, is able to absorb, and this thing is a nitrate and phosphate fiend, will be able to absorb at least some of those wasted materials, use them to grow, and then convert them into a, a package that can be exported into the tank or recycled back into its grander ecology in the form of all these good nutritional components we talked about in our first step there. The fifth major reason I am absolutely bewitched with Tetracelmus as a whole is the mounting body of scientific evidence that is suggesting that many species of Tetracelmus, including Tetracelmus chui, have a diverse array of means of being able to combat other forms of microbial life. There is a reason why Tetracelmus is able to persist and conquer and be resilient if a fly falls into one of these cultures, it'll probably be fine. I'll just sift out the fly and probably bottle up a different culture altogether. If a fly falls into a T-iso or a roto, I cull the whole thing and feed it immediately. Tetracelmus is far tougher innately to all kinds of invaders, and it's suggested because it has all these various means, including the secretion of antibiotics, the uh, production of quorum inhibition, and the ability to just frankly block out and support other forms of microbial life that can knock in the teeth of some very dangerous agents. Some key examples I'd like to briefly uh, bring up here is that there have been a lot of very interesting petri dish studies where Tetracelmus grown on a petri dish is able to inhibit and eliminate the growth of all kinds of vibrios, including Vibrio corolliticus and Vibrio alginoliticus, which are very dangerous to corals and other shellfish and even shrimp. So in conclusion, here are but a few small abridged talking points of why I have, am slowly and surely developing a lifelong infatuation with the Tetracelmus green microalgae. It is an algae of the people that can be grown in most sterilized bathtubs under a wide range of commonly available lights. You don't need specialized equipment to work with it, but what profound benefits may come from working with it, from playing with it, from growing it? as this is an algae with a profound nutritional profile, a wide range of applications in both small and large scale aquaculture, an algae which has been demonstrated to provide infinite possible opportunities for eliminating pathogenic bacteria and sucking up and reclaiming poisonous and potentially excess nutrients and reclaiming them back into good nutrition. This is an algae which I think the reef aquarium industry will do nothing but benefit from playing with, learning from, 
and extrapolating and, and becoming lost in, in the future. And it's with these rationale in mind that I encourage you to get some Tetracelmus. Grow some Tetracelmus. Play with Tetracelmus. See how it affects various things in and outside your reef aquarium. Use it to grow pods. Use it to grow a great many things because Tetracelmus has within its green waters an infinitely higher potential value than if it were even a sea of whole emeralds. I'd like to end this episode on a quick question. How many of you have grown Tetracelmus at home? How many of you dose it to your reef tank? Have you used it to grow pods or have you used it as far as, as a part of some marine breeding operations? Love to hear your comments and any experience you've had with this species of microalgae and we will see you next time.